Welcome back everybody. So I tried Google's Notebook LM yesterday and I have to admit, it kind of blew my mind. Now, if you haven't heard about what it is yet, then watch this. There's a new hit podcast taking X in the tech world by storm. It's called Google Deep Dive. It's taking on everything from the latest in science to classical literature. The only catch, the hosts aren't real. And the producer is you. This is all part of Google's new Notebook LM project. And Dear Trebosa has more in today's Tech Check. Hi, Dee. Morgan, I hope you're intrigued because instead of telling you about this new tool, I'm going to show it to you. Now, earlier in the show, I heard that you guys were talking about that JP Morgan iPhone survey. Here's another version of that in podcast form with two AI generated podcasters. Have a listen. Get this. We're diving deep into iPhone territory today, mm -hmm. but not just any iPhone chit chat. Right. We're talking about why people are really shelling out for those new Apple phones. Luckily, we've got some clues to work with. Mm -hmm. We've got this juicy J.P. Morgan survey. Yeah. Over 500 people oh. gave their insights on smartphones and buying decisions. That's a pretty good sample size, actually. Yeah, it gives us a good snapshot of what's really going on. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but this blew my mind. This is all AI generated, and it sounds pretty close to how someone might expect Carl and I or Carl and Morgan to sound on a podcast breaking down that J.P. Morgan survey right down to the uh-huhs and the banter. It's worth the full 10-minute listen, which we'll post. So, yeah, when I saw this, I was like, whoa, I've got to try this for myself. And so I did yesterday, and I'm going to show you exactly how easy it was to do. So we simply go to notebooklm.google.com and you click create to create a new notebook, and you start adding your sources. Now in my case, I'm gonna use the DOJ's complaint against Visa, because if you remember, it was a 70 plus page document that I went through manually to make my video. And once you add your source, you'll see on the right, audio overview and deep dive conversation with two hosts, English only. So if you simply click generate, then it starts to create your audio podcast. Now, my experience, it took probably about five minutes, which seems like a long time if you're waiting on the browser for it to come back, but it really was pretty quick. And then once it's done, you can see you have Untitled Notebook right here, and it created a 12-minute podcast about the DOJ's complaint on Visa. Now, it gives you some options. You can download it. You can change the playback speed and all that type of stuff so you can actually use the audio file. So at this point, you're probably like, yeah, okay, whatever, but I want to hear the actual quality of the content in the podcast. Well, take a listen. All right, everybody, welcome back. Ready to dive into another deep dive. Absolutely. Got my scuba gear ready. Today, we're wading into the waters of the U.S. debit card market. And let me tell you, things are about to get interesting. Yeah, this isn't just about swiping plastic at the grocery store. We're talking billions of dollars, alleged monopolies, and a new complaint from the DOJ that has visa sweating. So uh, for those of us who just use our debit cards to, you know, buy coffee and stuff, what's the big deal? Well, imagine this. You're at the coffee shop. right? Yeah. You go to pay, grab your debit card without even thinking about it. Pretty much my morning routine. Yeah. Right. We all do it. But that seemingly simple tap just plugged you into a massive system. And the DOJ claims Visa has been pulling the strings, stifling competition and maybe even costing you money. They're called non-contestable transactions. Non-contestable. Okay, that sounds a little intimidating. It's actually pretty straightforward. Think of it like this. These are specific transactions where Visa basically has exclusive control. Other networks can't touch them. So even if a business wanted to use a different network, sometimes they wouldn't even have a choice. That's what the DOJ is claiming. And they say Visa used this to their advantage by offering businesses what you might call a Hobson's choice. A Hobson's choice. That sounds more like a lose-lose situation than a choice. It basically is. The DOJ's case suggests that Visa saw these fintech companies, especially the big ones like Apple Pay and PayPal, as a direct threat to their power. But those companies aren't really the same, are they? I mean, I use Apple Pay with my Visa card sometimes. Right, but that's exactly what Visa wants you to do. Use Apple Pay, but keep it tied to your existing cards and banks. What really worries them is the potential for these fintech companies to cut them out of the equation entirely. Imagine. Wait, like a world without Visa. Think about it. You use your phone, or maybe even just your face, to make payments directly from your bank account to the store. Yeah. No plastic card, no Visa network in the middle taking a cut. Okay, yeah, when you put it like that, I can see why they'd be a little concerned. So one of the reasons this was a great example for me is because I did an hour-long video about this DOJ complaint to Visa, so I'm pretty familiar with the document, at least the highlights to understand what the key points were, at least that I took from it. So to hear this recap in a 12-minute podcast that I thought really hit a lot of the same points 
was pretty cool. Now, I will say, when it comes to kind of what's good and what's bad about this, obviously, the fact that you can create something so quickly in a document that's so big and get kind of the main points out of it is pretty amazing. And I'm just not sure we really understand all the benefits that this can actually provide for us just as individuals as it relates to learning and productivity. And I think that's something that hopefully becomes clear over time. But there are a couple of things that are important to point out. The first one is just, it's going to take the tone and perspective of whatever source material you give it. And the reason why I think that's more important to know is because it sounds like it's just two people talking, two people with their own perspectives, their own opinions on things, when really it's all based on the source material that you give it, so you're kind of driving the narrative. And to me, what this means is that even though it's generated by AI, there's still gonna be a lot of creativity and flexibility based on how you provide the sources to drive whatever message you're really trying to drive. So whether we call that good or bad is really gonna be up to your own perspective. To me, I just kind of look at it as there's still a level of kind of human creativity involved, it's just in a different way way. It's not you speaking on a podcast yourself, maybe. It's you putting together the combination of source material that provides a perspective or narrative that you're trying to get across. And to show you what I mean, I actually re-ran this podcast generation after adding my own video as a source, which if you watched it, you know I kind of took the other side of the DOJ complaint. And here's what it did. So we're doing a deep dive today. We're going straight to the source. Okay. We've got the actual complaint that the DOJ filed, mm -hmm. and we've got some really interesting insights from this YouTuber, Matt Duran. Yeah, I've seen his stuff. Oh, you know him. Yeah, he's got a good take on this. He does. He really does. And he offers a really compelling counter argument to what the DOJ is saying. Okay. So we're going to unpack both of those. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to decide for yourself. Right. That's the idea, right? Some transactions, like when you use your PN, mm -hmm. those can be routed through those other networks. But here's the thing about those contracts. The DOJ is saying that Visa is using them to control everything. Darren had a really good analogy for this. Oh, yeah. He compared it to a fast food restaurant or something. Exactly. So imagine you're that restaurant owner. You need people to be able to pay with their debit cards. Yeah. Right? So you sign a contract with Visa. Sure. You got to accept Visa if you want to stay in business. Exactly. Yeah. But then Visa says, okay. We know you need us for all those transactions that only go through our network. But if you want a lower fee for those, you have to promise that you'll route all of your debit transactions through us, even the ones where you have a choice. Hold on. So they're basically saying, sure, you have other options, but you're going to pay more if you use them. That doesn't seem very fair. Yeah, the DOJ calls it a Hobson's choice. Is Visa really the bad guy here? Well, Darren brings up some good points. He thinks the DOJ is maybe overstating things a bit. Okay, how so? Well, he's not saying the visa perfect, but he's saying they're not necessarily hurting consumers or stopping innovation. Okay, so what's his argument? Well, one thing is he says visa is just doing what business is, you know, trying to make money and stay ahead of the game. So they're playing hardball, but it's not necessarily against the rules. Yeah, basically. And Darren also says that visa got to be big by actually offering something valuable. Remember yeah. how we were talking about how easy it is to use your debit card? He says Visa spent a lot of money building this network that's really reliable and secure. And he points out that, yeah, those smaller competitors might have lower fees. Right. But can they really say the same about fraud protection, for example, or having that global reach that Visa does? So as you can see, now the podcast is slightly different. Like the tone is slightly different where it's trying to balance out the narrative a little bit and talking about both sides of the issue. And it's pretty crazy when you listen to the full versions of these podcasts, because of course there's going to be parts where it sounds kind of computer generated or maybe a little wonky, but a lot of it sounds pretty natural, which is a little scary, but kind of cool at the same time. So if you actually want to listen to the full versions of those podcasts that I created, both versions of them, then I'll put a link to a video where I kind of put them back to back so you can compare. And just real quick, a couple other things you can do with Notebook LM. You don't have to create an audio podcast. You can create things like an FAQ, a study guide, where it'll literally generate it for you based on the source material that you give it. So let's talk about my overall thoughts on Notebook LM. Now, just right off the bat, to me, it was pretty mind-blowing to say, here's a 70-page PDF about a DOJ complaint against Visa, and I can upload it and within five minutes have a 12-minute recap that sounds kind of natural between two people back and forth that is easier to kind of digest than obviously a 70-page PDF is. So I just think on that level, it's pretty amazing technology. And what that's going to mean for us to learn and just be productive 
I don't think we really understand the impact of that yet, but it's going to be big. Now, is it perfect? No, right? Like there's no way that anything that we do in this space is perfect. And that's one of the big criticisms people have about Gen AI. They're like, oh yeah, but it's wrong a lot of times. And I guess my view on that is, you know, just talking to humans, even if they're experts, they can be wrong a lot of times, right? So I think we need to get in the habit of scrutinizing any information that we get from any source, whether it's a person that you know and trust or a computer that is trying to do some kind of summation of a 70-page document in a 12-minute podcast, right? Both of those things to me can be useful, they can be helpful, and they can help us learn, but they still need to be scrutinized with our own filter of, okay, how much of this am I taking at face value? What pieces of this am I going to take? And what other pieces am I going to, you know, maybe look into a little bit deeper because I'm not sure. And I did notice that in certain parts of the podcast, in trying to make the host sound natural with their kind of back and forth banter, it sometimes missed the original intent of the source material. Now, that honestly happens even with humans all the time, but it's just something to be aware of. Of It's not just like a computer that they're only going to give you facts. They're going to give you some kind of artistic version of the source material that you provided. And it can definitely be helpful, but it doesn't mean that it's something you should take as like, a case study. And to be fair, you shouldn't really take a case study at face value either. There's always bias in things that we listen to or read, and we just need to know that. And to me, that might be one of the biggest dangers with this because people will say, well, it's coming from a computer, it's computer generated, and so whatever it's telling me is truth. Well, that really shouldn't be how we approach anything, in my opinion. Because people can put together source material that drives a specific narrative they want, much like a person can go on a podcast today and have a very strong opinion one way or another. So just understanding kind of what it is and what it isn't is going to be important for all of us. But bottom line is this, if this type of technology helps people get into like a DOJ complaint against Visa where in the past it'd be like it's 70 pages I'm not spending time on this and now they're like well you know what I'm going to listen to this 12 minute podcast and I'm way more informed about it than I would have been had it not been there then that's a net positive in my opinion because think about what that does for our own ability to learn and be productive across a billion other topics that may be more interesting to us so overall to me this is pretty amazing stuff Okay, but this is a stock investing channel. So what does this actually mean for investors, maybe Google specifically, and the market as a whole? And I think the answer to that is we don't really know yet, right? I mean, this is one of the things that we're struggling with with Gen AI in a lot of these areas is what is the actual business case for this? What is the ROI for this? You know, I could speculate on some real basic ideas like, oh, they can create this as a podcast generator that you have to pay for, or, you know, any podcast episode that's generated by this tool will have have Google ads on it or something basic or low IQ like that. I don't think that's going to be the ultimate use case for this technology. Um, it'll probably be something more along the lines of general knowledge and productivity being able to be ramped up at a certain pace that we're not able to do at least today. But it's yet another example of how quickly the AI space is evolving because I've used the major AI assistants for a while now, meaning ChatGPT, Gemini, Claude, and Meta AI just to kind of try them out. And it's crazy how much they've improved just in the last year or so. And one thing's for sure, you can tell how this type of technology is going to totally change the game as it relates to content creation. And you can hear the fear in the podcaster's voice in that CNBC clip. I have so many questions. <laughs> I have so many. Yay. And I, 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 I will definitely listen to the full thing here. Um, as a podcaster myself, I'm really curious how this is going to shake out. And this reminds me of a very sweet and heartfelt comment that I got under one of my AI videos with someone basically saying, well, speaking of redundant jobs, content like yours is exactly exactly the type of content that AI can already produce within seconds, which they very well might. But the question will be, well, what type of source material are they using to generate it? And what perspective and narrative are they trying to push? It's going to be hard to tell. But speaking of channel comments, my next video is going to be another Q&A. So expect that later this week. So what did you all think about Google's Notebook LM and that automated podcast generator? Let me know down in the comments below. Now, if you want to watch my real human recap of the DOJ's complaint against Visa, you can watch that by by clicking this video right here. Hope you guys have a great day out there. Financial independence is true freedom. So keep building and stacking wins and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.